Travis, I am absolutely delighted to finally have you on the Modern Warrior podcast. This has been a long time coming and uh, thank you for your patience and grateful for your presence here today. Gavin, dude, thanks for having me. I know it was like, uh, um, it was like playing Calendly tag uh, for like <laughs> Yeah. three months so yeah but like i said you know stuff happens for a reason so of i'm course. sure we'll I'm sure we'll find that reason in this episode we will man we will we're about to um break the internet here so so yeah th this is called the modern war podcast and i bring guests on here who have um this or do display that warrior mentality that warrior um bring that warrior presence into their life and with every warrior they have battles to face and battles to overcome and i know you've had one massive battle recently and before we dive into that can you bring us back to your birthday in august of this year and why tell us why that birthday was um very special for you this year yeah man uh turned 32 on august 31st this year and it was either the day before or two days. I think it was two days before. Um, on August 29th, I had a follow-up doctor's appointment and got the news that I was officially cancer-free. Uh, so that birthday meant a lot to me. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not a big like birthday celebrator, uh, and which is strange to say because every year on my birthday we usually do like a trip with a bunch of friends. Uh, but it just happens. To, it's just kind of works out that way because my birthday is August 31st, and um, it's kind of like the last couple of weeks of August, first week of September is like kind of the time of the year that everybody takes time off or like goes on a trip or goes on vacation or whatever. And so uh, it just kind of works out because a lot of my friends are in that mode and they they want to go somewhere and do something. And so it was just kind of like, hey, this is an excuse to get, you know, six to 10 of our closest friends together and just go do like random things at a random place and, and hang out for a little bit. Um, but in terms of my birthday itself, it was never something that I was like, we got to like, you know, make sure you get me a cake and sing happy birthday. You know what I mean? It was never about that. It was just hanging out with my friends. Um, but this year, yeah, it, it kind of taught me the importance of birthdays. You know what I'm, I'm, especially as like an adult male, I think it's kind of like not taboo, but just kind of weird. If you're always like pumped about your birthday, you know, <laughs> just feels like, Hey man, uh, it's time to grow up. You're not six, you know, you're 30. Um, but it, it gave me a fresh perspective on the birthday. And I, I think that, uh, it gave me, um, something to look forward to every year. Uh, just like a mark, like, you know, the, the joke is, you know, like, what are you celebrating? The fact that you didn't die, you know, like everybody does that if they're alive, you know, it's like, yeah, but I think, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, I, I uh, this year I was celebrating the fact that I was still alive. Um, and, and it made me very uh, reflective on, on my life. And I think that your birthday can be a really good time to sit down, look at the past year um, and evaluate, you know, where you're at, where you're headed. Um, gives you just like another point to look at, to be grateful, uh, to sit in, 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 and soak in gratitude, uh, for the fact that you are still alive <clears throat> and the, and you get the opportunity to continue aging. So as you were evaluating the last year, what were some of the uh, key takeaways that, that mm -hmm. you, uh, that you took from that? Well, I'll tell you <clears throat> one thing in stoic philosophy, uh, which is one of the philosophy, um, uh, I guess one of the, one of the schools of philosophy that I, that I pull from the most. And one of their core tenets is to, to meditate on your own death. And I, I, because of my study of stoicism, I think that I've probably meditated on my death more than most, you know, 30 somethings or 20 somethings. Cause I started studying in my late twenties. Um, but this year it was a much more visceral, experience um you know medit meditating on that because it was like it felt so real and it felt so close and it felt it felt like i it felt like i shook hands with the grim reaper and then walked away you know what i mean so it was like a um a confrontation of of my own mortality in a very real way uh and so that that was really what i was meditating on the most man and and it made me reflect on the way that I've been living my life, some of the decisions that I've been making and not even like bad ones, just, you know, a couple of things that I was doing that were kind of in that sunk cost fallacy that was just like, well, I'm, I'm doing this because I put this much work into it. I've been doing it for the last few years. Um, but why am I really doing it? Am I really only doing it because of this thing? Because like in a couple hundred years from now, none of it's going to matter anyway. 
you know what I mean? Like we're all, we're all going to be gone. And in a thousand years from now, we likely won't even be remembered. And only the, only the history books um, type people will be remembered like the Elon Musk's of the world. And it's like, I don't frankly have any desire to be an Elon Musk. <laughs> um, I, that guy's schedule, his life is insane. And I, I wouldn't want to trade my life for that. And so like coming to terms with that, just realizing that like, it doesn't mean that you treat things with a, a, a apathetic attitude. It just means that you should consider frequently why you're continuing to do what you do. And if it doesn't light you up and it doesn't make you happy, it doesn't make you feel fulfilled. It doesn't bring any joy. It doesn't really serve a purpose beyond just like, it's what I got to do. Um, then maybe it's time to reevaluate. And that was one of the biggest takeaways for me from this past year. Hmm. D- does the, Does do the lessons and what you gain from that experience of being so close to death does does that sort of diminish over time as you get back into normal living a normal life and normal tasks and you sort of I think a lot of human beings are susceptible to amnesia like we forget yeah. the lessons we forget the um, the challenges and you know the the strength and resilience that 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 established in our life having gone through those difficult situations and then when we're faced with the next struggle we fail to look back and realize oh hang on a second i just i've overcome much more difficult situations like this so of course i'll i'll handle this too mm-hmm. but as i said we've got this you know amnesia um yeah. that, that we sort of forget um our level of capability and did you feel that that's something that could potentially diminish over time or is it something that you are honing and focusing on on a regular basis so that you continue to hold on to that do do you feel that's important to do i think it's absolutely important to do i think that is also very natural for it to kind of like fade into the distance and be a a rear view mirror type thing Uh, but there's absolutely value in continuing to think about it uh, especially especially in controlled environments you can't let it you know you, you can't let those types of things be pervasive um, or else you're just stuck in the past and you're just constantly thinking about the past, which is not a good place to be either. Uh, but uh, you know, moving past things and then forgetting lessons is certainly not the way you're supposed to live life. You know, like what, what are the, what are the pros of the failures? What are the pros of the losses? What are the pros of the struggles? If you don't remember the lessons that come from them, uh, so it's absolutely something that I, that I've, you know, and it's still pretty recent. I mean, we're, uh, we're recording this in October. This was August. So this is a couple months ago. So, you know, maybe I, I might be able to answer that question more effectively in five years from now, you know what I mean? Because that will fade into the distance. And it feels like it was like, I, I say a brush with death, but like I had it so easy, man, compared to so many other people who get that diagnosis. Uh, for me, it was like, I found out in mid June and then I was cleared you know, end of August. So it, it was a pretty, you know, flash in the pan type of a thing. And it, it just all like it ran together so much and it all happened so fast um, that while it was happening, I didn't really have a chance to like sit and to sit with it and, and work through uh, the emotions that, um, you know, that I felt during that time. So, uh, so afterwards, it's been a little bit more of that uh, than it was even during it. So it's still pretty fresh. Uh, for me. And it's not something that I've, uh, that I've forgotten about at all. In fact, it's kind of difficult for me to not talk about it, but I try not to, because again, everybody has their own, their own struggles and I don't want to beat a dead horse with it. And I, you know, I'm not the type of person to just like go put, you know, cancer survivor in my Instagram bio to just remind people that I had cancer one time, you know what I mean? Um, and like I said, it, it feels like a brush with death, but ultimately we caught it really early. We got very lucky. Um, and we're able to you know, get surgery, remove the bad parts. I didn't even have to do chemo or anything like that. I still got my hair, you know what I mean? Um, so, so it wasn't, it wasn't, um, as, as much of a life altering thing as it is for a lot of other folks. And so I know that, I know that that's also a factor, but there was, it was really just like the two, three weeks of just complete uncertainty where it was just difficult to go to sleep. It was difficult to, uh, to think about doing anything other than, you know, focus on that. It, it was just, it was, it was, it was difficult, um, during that time. And that, that was when I really had to like do some deep work to go into like, man, how do I, how do I just keep working? How do I just keep going to the gym and, and doing my normal stuff when I know this is looming over me? Like, how do I have a conversation with random people who, especially people who like know me, but don't know me, know me. Um, cause like, 
you know, people, people just ask you, you know, people always ask you this, Hey, how you doing, man? You know? And it's like, you give them the canned response of no, great, great. How's everything going with you? And, but all you really, you know, want to say is like, actually pretty terrible. Uh, I got some pretty bad news, but like, you don't want to, you know, you can't do that in small interactions with people at the gym or the grocery store or whatever. Um, so you just have to learn how to, how to, how to live with it and, and work through it and get on the other side of it. And so, like I said, I'm, I'm really blessed and lucky that it, it, it was a really short period of time for me. Uh, but like I said, maybe three, five years from now would be a better time for me to answer that question. How did you manage that? The being in the middle of the shit storm and lack in clarity, a lot of confusion and, uh, really not knowing what's going to come next. And you're trying to live your life as normal as possible. How, how did you manage that? What were some of the strategies that you began to lean on and, and utilize? I think the best way for me specifically, and this may not work for everybody, was to allow myself <clears throat> to go to the dark places I was desperately, you know, trying to avoid. Uh, I think most people try to avoid the the dark places, and, and and you know, even talking about death, most people don't want to talk about it. And I had a fascinating conversation on my podcast with um, a death doula recently, and she. Uh, it's literally her job. I didn't even know that this thing existed until I had this conversation with her. Uh, but she wrote a New York Times bestseller, a memoir of her time as a death doula and stuff. It's fa it's, it's a great book. It's called Briefly Perfectly Human. Um, and I um, uh, highly recommend her. Her name is Elua Arthur. And we had this conversation um, about death. And, 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 we're, and what was interesting is that she had this like, this bright, uh, infectious, optimistic energy about her. Uh, which would be the opposite of what you would think somebody who sits with people as they die for a living would have. Uh, but her work with death has made her that much more grateful for every breath she gets to take. And I think that avoiding the dark places um, is, is, is detrimental for most people. You just keep, you keep, you never deal with it if you don't face it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so, um, that was the only way I knew how to deal with it during that time was just to allow myself to go there, um, a couple of times and, and think through what that would, you know, actually be like. And, uh, I think that kind of gave me a little bit of, a little bit of power back, um, over, over it because, um, once I accepted that that was a potential reality, um, it was just kind of like, okay, that's happening that's the current scenario and I can either sit in a corner and whine about it um, until I get some news that's going to bring me on the, other, on the other side of it um, or I can keep living living my life and, and finding, you know, um, magic in the little moments and so that's what I try to do. Yeah, that's a worthwhile exercise for everyday life. Not just when you're so. faced with a, a cancer diagnosis, because we never, we never know when this right. moment's going to arrive. So, yeah, contemplating your death helps you to uh, live a fuller life, I believe, and, and it puts it, everything in perspective, man. Like mm. the the stuff that you're worried about every day. You know, we we are a very privileged society that the main problem we now are facing is anxiety, is stress, is depression. And I'm not trying to downplay those things at all. They're very real and they're, and they're, and they're pervasive and they, they, they steal people's happiness. Um, but it's a, it, it's, it's a luxury problem. You know, if you, if you, if you go to like a third world country, they don't, they don't struggle with anxiety because they're worried about where their next meal is coming from because they're worried about the quality of their water. They don't have access to literally the essence of life, which is good quality, like drinking water. Like we just take for granted here all the time because we can go to our reverse osmosis faucet on the side of our sink and grab pure life-giving water. Um, and that's something that, that, we, we take for granted. And so we have all of our core problems solved. And so we as humans, uh, we, we're, we're built to go solve more problems. And so when, when we solve 
when we solve a problem, all it does is present a new set of problems. And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. If we didn't have problems to solve, then we would all just be, you know, walking around and, 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 uh, and we, we think, we think that that's nirvana. We think that that's like the goal is to not have problems. And that's, that's not the goal. The goal is to be able to, um, to move forward in the face of problems, um, not to just not have them. There's a great, uh, show called, um, the good place. It's a kind of a, a, a not sitcom, but a, kind of a comedy type show written by Michael Schur, and he produced it as well. Who's he's the producer of you know Brooklyn Nine Nine, The Office, Parks and Rec. Um, brilliant writer, great uh, comedy writer, and uh, but he also he wrote a book called How to Be Perfect, um, and uh, perfect is spelled with two T's. And the the whole book is a is is his you know take on on philosophy and and life and stuff and so the the show the good place is basically this mental exercise of like um you know what happens after death and it's there's heaven and there's hell and then not to spoil the entire thing but um essentially it ends up with a lot of people going to like quote unquote heaven and in heaven nobody has any problems and then um and then it gets to the point where people are choosing to no longer be in paradise and to walk into non-existence uh, because they can't stand being in paradise one second longer because they, they, there's, there's, there's no problems to solve. There's, there's, there's no uh, things to overcome. And it leads to this, this, this just sense of nothingness. And so they, they start longing for the nothingness and eventually everybody, you know, makes the decision to walk through this door that allows them to basically not exist at all. When the alternative is to exist in paradise where everything's taken care of, there's no problems at all. Um, it was, uh, I, I thought a, a really well done show. Um, because it, it, like I said, he's a great writer and Kristen Bell is the, is the main protagonist and she's a great actress and everything. And, um, I thought it was just done really well, but it, I, I thought it was also just a, a really great perspective on on what it's like to actually be in a place where no problems exist. And I don't think that that's I don't think that's a worthy pursuit. And I, I don't think that I don't think that any of us would be happy if we were in that scenario. So trying to to craft this life that's problem free is it's 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 only ideal because we don't know what it's like to experience it. But I think that if we did know what it was like to experience it, we wouldn't be happy there for a long time anyway yeah that's definitely a a loaded area i think in the absence of problems your brain creates problems and then you know yep. that that's that's probably where the anxiety and depression comes from as well i mean if you had a defined purpose in life you have no time to be anxious you know time to be depressed you have a mission you have to yep. accomplish and that means so much more than dwelling and sitting and worrying about your problems and worrying about certain aspects of your life and is that a place you've you've found yourself in before with this um darkness or confusion or lack of clarity or feeling lost or bewildered in life having to find your way oh absolutely yeah yeah um on you know several occasions you know it wasn't even just a cancer thing it was just that that just was the elephant in the room you know what i mean it's like it's like if you're sitting on a table and you have a bunch of papers spread across the table and all of these papers you have written down different problems that you're experiencing in your life and you're trying to sort through these problems you're trying to figure out how to solve them and you have some anxiety about those problems and and uh, you have some stress and um, maybe you're depressed about it and you have all these different things that you're trying to work through cancer is like somebody dropped a hippopotamus on the table. You know what I mean? It's like, whoa, yeah. now all of a sudden, like I can't even see these other problems because this giant hippo got sat on all of my papers and I have to remove this problem before I can even think about what all these other problems are. So it just kind of, it just became like a singular focus problem <laughs> rather than erasing all the other ones. Um, but through that um, exercise, um, you know, it also kind of destroys the table and gets you to you know, get up and walk around and move around and, and, and create a fresh perspective to come back to the table with when you can eventually remove the hippo, you know, what's on the table now then? Oh, now it's just, now it's just all regular life problems. You know what I mean? Like, uh, um, I'm wearing this ever bowl shirt. My wife and I just started a, um, Aussie bowl franchise here in Vegas, um, this past weekend, it just, uh, just got opened up. And so now 
you know, the grand opening was great and there was a lot of things to solve going up to that. My wife killed it and she crushed um, the prep and did 90% of the work to get us to the opening. And then, and then it's like, uh, I still have my business guestio and then I still have my podcast and then we have two kids and now we have this Everbowl franchise. So now it's just a matter of like juggling plates, moving schedules, um, figuring out what life looks like with her being in the store a lot and me, I'm um, taking up you know, more of the responsibility with the kids while also running the business and the podcast. And so now it's just a bunch of regular life problems, you know what I mean? But, uh, they, they seem, they seem, um, uh, much easier to solve these days uh, than they did six months ago. Have your values changed since that whole experience? Are, are you focusing more now on, on family, on children, on your wife, on the things that maybe not things that maybe, but things that matter more to you than than, than the work, than the, uh, than the business. Yeah. You know, it was actually kind of interesting to me, um, uh, because like when I was thinking that during that time when I just didn't know what was going on, it was really easy for me to settle into this, like, um, uh, Hey, all this other stuff doesn't matter, but it also created this internal desire to have accomplished more for the sake of my family. Um, you know, then, then I, I, it was, it was surprising to me. So to answer that question, I, I honestly, no, cause I, I think I, I think I do an, a good job intentionally of like spending time with my family, being with my kids. Um, but when I was like facing with that, I was just like, man, I, I, if, if this was it, I wish I would have like done some more things to, to make a bigger impact before I, I leave this planet. And so it, it, it it gave me a fresh perspective on the importance of finding purpose and meaning in your work. Um, not just finding purpose and meaning in the the relationships that are closest to you. So it almost had a little bit of an opposite effect for me, to be honest with you. Um, but, uh, this is coming from somebody who intentionally spent a lot of time with his family before. So I think that maybe if I were like actively only completely and continuously in the pursuit of the business or whatever, um, I think that a problem that it might've had that effect on me. But, you know, I think that when you're faced, when, when you're face when you come face to face, with something like that, it just, it highlights your deficits. And that was a deficit for me was like, man, I'm not like, I need to, I need to reconnect with my purpose behind the work that I do um, so that I can continue to push things forward and set a better example for my kids on what I want them to pursue in their life. Yeah. And it's not just that you were a great family man bef before all that happened. You had a thriving business and you have a thriving business as well. So that to look at it from the outside in, and you know, we all look at people's lives from the outside in. we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes, but to look at your business and your model and, uh, your life seems very successful and within that success, I know it's taken a lot of failures along the way. And as you reflect back on your journey in business, is there one failure that stands out the most that as you reflect back now actually turned into quite a success? Hmm. That's or a good question. In in initiated success um yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not 100 sure man that's a good question i'd have to i'd have to really think about that to give you a good answer honestly i i, I would really i don't want to just give you a canned answer just because we're on an episode right now i, I would like uh, that's something i'd like to think about a little bit more the the setbacks along the way the, the, how have you managed those it just in in general in, in terms of the business and stuff in terms of the business and your successes in life yeah. I, I mean, not well, you know, I, I wish, I wish I would have handled them better. Um, I, you know, when, when, when you're facing, when you're facing a problem that you don't know how to solve, it can be really overwhelming and, um, and you can, you can start to, you can start to get into a spiral of negative emotions and, uh, the one thing that I wish I would have done more is allowed the people in my life to be there for me. I, I tend to struggle with, um, I, I don't struggle with being there for others, but I do struggle with allowing people to be there for me, which I think is potentially more selfish than the opposite. Um, because the people in your life that are closest to you, they, they want to be there for you and they, they want to love you through struggle and they want to help you 
do those things. And I, I was, I was, I was too selfish to let people in because I felt that it was going to, um, show a weakness in my armor. Um, and I, I think that this is something that specifically that, 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 uh, young men face, uh, even more so than, than others. Um, just because, you know, it's, it's part of quote unquote, being a man is just to like, you know, bear down and, 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 uh, not show weakness and to, sh and to show this, this version of you that's really strong and that doesn't have these, these types of struggles and things like that. And so I think that's one big lesson that I learned through, through the failures that I've had inside of business, the failures that I've had in, in life through the cancer diagnosis, um, that, uh, it, it was, it was telling to me that, you know what, I think I've, I think I've been a selfish friend that I haven't, I haven't and uh, allowed people to see me struggle that I haven't allowed those closest to me, uh, my audience to examine my failures alongside of me as I'm going through them. And that's something that I'm trying to get better at. Mm, I'm with you there, man. Yeah. Something I would also have difficulty with. It's also the sense that you don't want to burden them with your, with your problems. You exactly right. To, uh, yeah. Yeah. I literally recorded an episode on this um, for my for my podcast. I'm starting to do solo shows again. And since the show is called Travis Makes Friends, a lot of the solo shows now are going to be dedicated toward friendship, um, eliminating the epidemic of loneliness, um, building better relationships. And so I've been doing a lot of research on it. And this is literally something that's very top of mind for me because I just put out a full episode on this. And that was one of those things that I that I talked about. And I use that exact verbiage like we don't want to be a burden to those around us. So we we keep our struggles inside. Um, but that's the worst place for them to be, man. Mm. I did a post there recently. It was actually after I listened to a, a radio show segment and pretty much what you said in terms of there's a loneliness epidemic out there for men. Yeah. Why do you think that is? <sighs> well, for men specifically, I think there's a, I think that there's a, a few reasons, um, First of all, it's not unique to our generation. A lot of people like to vilify social media and look at it as the root cause of all of this. And I, I'm not one of those people. Um, I think loneliness, uh, I mean, the data would support it too. Loneliness has increased annually since 1976, uh, long before social media was around. I think social media, the, the more insidious nature of social media is that it implies connection. The word social is literally in the phrase. So it implies that it brings us closer together when it really actually drives us further apart and creates more anxiety and does not fulfill the internal human desire for connection and building genuine real relationships with people. So that's like, that's the insidious nature of social media. And I think that it, it's compounding things that were already existing. Uh, so it's definitely a problem not to say that it's, it's all good and hundred percent, you know, uh, it's not, it's not the you know best thing since sliced bread in that context, but uh, it's not as evil, I think, as what most people would would claim that it is, um, but it's certainly it's certainly one of the core aspects of it, especially for this generation, and especially for the generation even coming up behind us. You know, the Gen Z uh, type uh, generation, the the twenty year olds right now. And instead, you know, I'm thirty two. The twenty the twenty somethings, the people in their late teens and, and early teens. You know, um, that generation is going to deal with it because of social media and in a way that was much worse than the way we dealt with it. You know, like. I wasn't really on Instagram and Facebook until college. You know, I had it a little bit in high school, but it wasn't really until college until those things were like front and center for me. So people that are like growing up on, on especially TikTok, just because it's, um, again, it, it says social, but it's not really social. Uh, so it, it, you think you're filling the need for, you think you're filling the loneliness need by being on these platforms and you're actually making it worse by doing that. Um, so in, in, uh, and I know that's a roundabout way to, to start answering this question, but social media is one of those things is to say that like for, for, for young people in general, and then you go more specifically young men, uh, there's, there's an attack that's been happening on masculinity as a whole. And, uh, that's been happening for, you know, the past decade plus, uh, where masculine attributes are being vilified and, uh, and certainly Certainly the extreme of, you know, of, of masculinity, which I would not, which I would no longer define as being masculine, by the way, um, is, is 
is is also a poor example of masculinity but that's the reason that young men are are looking for these answers and falling for these these traps this like andrew tate level of masculinity that you know he that he preaches uh which i think is is not actual masculinity they're falling for that because they they're craving acceptance of their masculine traits they're they're craving acceptance of their internal natural desires to be manly and so much of society especially if they didn't grow up with a good role model of what masculinity looks like they didn't have a dad in the house or something like that um and then all the the you know the uh, women and the thought leaders that they're looking at are being like oh ma you know toxic masculinity toxic masculinity they're, they're marrying these two terms together like it's something that exists but in my in my mind like toxic masculinity is not a thing because as soon as you assign the word toxic to masculinity to me it's no longer masculinity like andrew tate's not toxic masculinity it's just not masculinity like that's not what it means to be a man um so you're, you're conflating these two things together and it's confusing an entire generation of young men who have these internal desires to be masculine to show masculine traits to be a man uh, but they don't have a lot of good examples of what that looks like. And so um, they're, 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 they're falling into these fringe movements of people who are exhibiting an ideal type of masculinity who were obviously hurt by women at some point in their life, whether that was their mom growing up. A lot of it, I think, would probably stem back to childhood with their, with their mom. Um, it might have been a girlfriend or several girlfriends when they were a young man that, uh, that jaded them to the idea that women actually care about them and that they could have a good relationship with them. You know, there, there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, but I think it, it's, it's largely due to the fact that, like, there's just not a lot, a lot of great examples of of it and so you have these young men who are uh, who are not in the Andrew Tate camp who are desperately searching for something but keep getting told that the you know whatever the competition that they are exhibiting the aggressive the the aggression that they're exhibiting that these things are inherently bad things and that and if, if they feel these feelings of masculinity that's bad and you should feel guilty for that and you should apologize for that and you should engage in discourse that allows you to move away from that and to pick up more of these more feminine type qualities and it's like we all have masculinity and femininity in in us i'm not saying that you know um being in a feminine state is not is a bad thing because it's not you we all need to engage in both of them at, at some point um, but to just vilify all of masculinity is, is terrible. And, uh, you know, culture and society is going to feel a, a tail whip, um, from, from these young, lonely men who can't find a space to express how they really feel. And if you are in a place where you can't express how you really feel about things, you're going to be lonely. I don't care if you're surrounded by people who quote unquote care about you, you're surrounded by friends. If you don't feel the freedom to express who you truly are, you will always be lonely. Uh, and that's, that's, that's dangerous. You know, lonely young men is one of the most dangerous threats to society, um, I think. So, um, I, you know, I hope we can course correct from that. Yeah. Also, when you suppress those emotions, they are expressed then in unhealthy ways through... Right violence or through rape or through just yep. um yeah these these malicious um outbursts and yeah I'm, I'm i'm with you in all of this because it's something i'm quite passionate about is, is masculinity and the state of men at the moment but i don't usually dive into masculinity as such or toxic masculinity i just speak in a way that i believe men are to act and yeah. as you rightly said i think men need a balance of both feminine and masculine traits they, they need to merge together and the two of them complement each other so mm -hmm. the allowing yourself to express your your feelings and emotions is perhaps deemed a feminine trait yeah but if you don't allow yourself to practice that feminine trait of expressing your emotions they become suppressed and then they are expressed in toxic masculine ways yeah, so dangerous ways yeah but 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 i believe that a lot of men uh, again there's a lot of shame there's a lot of shame at, at, at the core of their mm -hmm. emotions and feelings and especially when you haven't had a strong role model who who displayed you know these these traits in a healthy way who was able to express his emotions and feelings and tell you that it's okay to be sad. It's okay to cry. It's okay to, you know, feel down. It's okay to feel disappointed. It's okay to 
have empathy towards others and mm -hmm. compassionate to have compassion towards others um, and to allow yourself to feel that. But then that's also in a way a masculine trait because it takes fucking courage. It takes strength to be able to express your emotions and express your feelings. It's absolutely, it's a, it's a tough thing to do for, for men. So there's a lot of strength required to, um, to display those, those characteristics and to display the, to express your, your difficulties. And what, what is your insight in terms of how we can course correct this? I mean, is this going to come through men like yourself, myself, others out there who are openly speaking up for these men or is there something more that needs to be done in order to, as you say, course correct? I think so. I, I tend to be on the, I tend to be on the level of personal responsibility for most problems in the world. And I think that if we take personal responsibility, that social responsibility become like comes as a natural result of that. So I think people being an example of what it looks like is, is, is definitely a good thing, but ultimately just like any other problem we face, it's going to come from inside of us, not just the external things that we do. It's not checking off the boxes. You know what I mean? It's, it's doing internal work. It's having a strong relationship with yourself, being self-aware, having self-confidence, um, becoming competent at something. Uh, all of those things are, are things that are going to help on an individual level. And I think if we, again, start on an individual level, that it's going to have a positive impact on a societal level. And so that's really what I've, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about is like, you know, if I ask most people, what's the antidote to loneliness, they would probably logically and sensibly say something like community, you know, uh, go hang out with people and, you know, and, and that's not bad advice, <clears throat> but the data actually suggests that the antidote to loneliness is aloneness that most people when faced with the, with the idea of being with themselves by themselves with no distractions, not by yourself scrolling on TikTok, not by yourself watching a movie, not, you know, by yourself listening to a podcast, even if it's good stuff, even if it's motivational, even if it's inspirational, even if it's good content that will put you in a positive mood. That's not what I'm talking about. If you will, if you never take the time to focus on having a good relationship, a strong relationship with yourself, then you will never feel connected to other people, even if you're surrounded by them, which is kind of the, um, it's kind of the mind fuck that we're all kind of faced with. You know what I mean? It's like, there, like, like I said, the data shows that loneliness is not, is not, uh, uh, exclusive to people who don't have friends. Loneliness is, is, uh, something that people experience even in the midst of being surrounded by people, which is, which is a much scarier, more pervasive form of it. Um, and, and I think it's important to define the terms. So like there's, there's two really main things. It's loneliness and social isolation. So if you define them, uh, social isolation would be the more objective definition where social isolation would be, you are not involved in groups. You don't have an active community. There's, there's, uh, not a lot of people around you. Maybe you work virtually, you're single, you, you know, do most of the things by yourself. Like that's objective. And we can look at that and we can all agree like, oh, that's social isolation. We understand what that means. Loneliness, however, is a subjective internal feeling of being distant from other people. And that's scarier because th that, that can be our best friends. That can be a spouse. That can be the people who we think are closest to us, who you're going to the, you know, the bar with every Friday night to catch up on the week and hang out and, and play some pool or whatever. Those people can feel those same feelings of loneliness that somebody who's engaged in social isolation constantly can also feel. So, um, I think that comes from an internal, um, kind of what I was mentioning earlier, a, a lack of being able to come to terms with who you are. And then if you haven't been able to come to terms with who you are, then you definitely have not allowed anybody else to see who you are. And those things are, I think is what, is what causes this. It's, it's the root cause of the problem. And so 
you have to be willing to spend enough time with yourself to get to know who you are so that you can allow other people to see you for who you truly are. Um, and until you do that, I, I think that, I think that you're going to, you're going to struggle. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I've been there. Loneliness is not cured by human connection. It's cured by connection with yourself. So mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, I've lived, I've lived through that in terms of being afraid to express my emotions and isolate myself from others, not allowing anyone in a lot of shame, as I mentioned, and that shame was then expressed through porn massively mm. through porn and that became an addiction mm. and the addiction eventually led to long story footage of me being exposed on a webcam chat room and that exposure as i reflect back on it now was actually a fucking relief because i had nothing to hide mm. anymore everything yeah. was out there and I didn't have to hide behind this wall of lies, trying to be this perfect, nice guy to yeah. everyone I met. You know, there's there's something here I was struggling with. And I remember when it happened, I had a conversation with uh, a good friend of mine at the time, and I was telling him about the the addiction and you know trying to make sense of of how I got there and how this this came to be, and just having an open conversation about the difficulties and struggles that that led to this situation. And mm. as I did that. It removed the barrier for him to then tell me about some of the struggles he was having around the mm. same issue. Yeah. And that created a connection that that still holds today. So again, within that we talk about masculine and feminine energies and it takes extreme courage to be able to open up about your struggles and difficulties. Yeah. But when you do that, you also inspire someone else to do the same and that's mm -hmm. where an incredible connection can can uh, can form and yeah. as i said that connection is is still very strong today so yeah i think it's completely right in what you're saying in terms of connecting to yourself understanding that there are certain there's certain pain or certain shame or certain difficulties you need to be with in order to process but then it's then understanding okay I'm I'm struggling with this. I've I've got this underlying yeah. trauma that I'm, I just can't get a handle on it. Uh, it's just carrying carrying it around like a, a bag of bricks every single day. Yeah, and I appreciate so I, you bringing that up because it yeah, it's a great example of how it's just this it's this loop that just continues feeding itself. Mm -hmm. It's like you feel lonely and you don't know how to deal with it. Uh, so you you try to distract yourself with something that's objectively bad for you when done on a daily basis like that, um, and you 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 fill that loneliness with with porn, with false connection, alcohol, mm -hmm. with drugs, um, addiction. Uh, you you avoid the people who care about you because you don't want to face who you truly are. And you certainly don't want to let them know who you truly are. And so you're constantly looking for these distractions. Um, and then it, it feeds into itself. It starts causing problems with your, you know, your, your mental health is obviously in a bad state, but then that bleeds into your physical health. If you feel, if you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling depressed, the last thing you want to do is get your ass out of bed and go to the gym or go for a walk or get sunlight or have proper nutrition even it's just it's easier to microwave a pizza and 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 play video games than it is to uh you know actually feed yourself some some proper nutrition that's going to make you feel better it, like it's not even it's not a placebo like proper nutrition makes you feel better legitimately you know even even drinking water having sunlight going for walks, a little bit of exercise, getting some sweat going, all of those things, they just start to feed each other. And then your physical health suffers and then your mental health suffers because your physical health is suffering and you start to, you know, you get all, you get lazy and you get fat and you don't, you're not productive at work and you're not fulfilled in your work. And so 
the last thing you want to do is do anything to improve any of those things because it's it 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 is going to eventually lead you back down to the rabbit hole that you know exists which is this problem that you're facing internally that you're not willing to face yourself that you're not willing to share with others um and then you just end up in this cycle of of depression the cycle of anxiety um and then you go see maybe a psychiatrist and they prescribe you some some drugs to to feed chemicals to your brain to lift your mood and lift your spirits. And again, this is not to downplay like real depression and anxiety or to say that nobody should be on any of those drugs or whatever. I, I think that they have their place. Um, I think that I just think that they're overused. I think that they're overprescribed just like regular medication for physical health is overprescribed. Um, because we think that we think that those things are going to solve our problems when really it's just doing the work that's going to solve the problem. It's just that doing the work is hard and it sucks. You know what I mean? And that like you're seeing that in, in the dating world. And I'm I'm I was married to my high school sweetheart at 21. So before any of these, you know, internet apps came came out, you know, Tinder and stuff like that. So I didn't have to deal with any of that. But that's exactly what it's doing. It's giving people an easier path to quote unquote success in a relationship, but it's not forcing people to learn the social skills that are required to have and maintain a proper relationship. Um, you know, so it's, it's taking all of the guesswork out of it and it's like, oh, it's so easy to, to, to use these apps or whatever. And it's like, yeah, but that's the problem. The problem is that it's easy and it's not supposed to be easy. You're supposed to have to learn. You're supposed to have to improve. You're supposed to have to get better. You're supposed to like, you're supposed to engage in these, in these, in, in form of the, in forming these skills, which are difficult to form. And when you rely on all of these other third party tools to just make things easier, whether it's a prescription drug or it's an app like Tinder, um, you know, you're, you are never forced to not just overcome the problem, but to build the skills or become the person who is capable of overcoming those problems. And so the next time you're faced with the problem, what are you going to do? You're not, you don't have this, the skill set or the tools to overcome those problems. You're just going to go look for something else. That's going to be the easy pill to take quote unquote, or whatever that is. Uh, and again, that's, if you look 10 years in the future, what is that going to do for you? You know, again, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to say you shouldn't use these things that are lifelines for some people. Um, but if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a way that, that, you know, if you've accepted that that's, oh, that's just who I am, you know, it's like, that's a dangerous place to be, man. It's a dangerous place to be. Hmm. Yeah. It also breeds a sense of entitlement. So you expect to be rewarded more with very little effort and then, well, and it makes you angry at the people who are closest to you. If the people who love you and are closest to you start seeing these patterns emerge and they have difficult conversations with you because they love you and care about you, your reaction is not, you're right, I should try to do something about this. Your reaction is just anger because you're just like, that's just who I am. Like, who are you to tell me, you know, my doctor told me I should be taking these pills. Like, you have no idea, you know, what I'm going, like, you you don't know my mental state. You don't know the chemical imbalance in my brain. Like, you don't know any of these things. How dare you tell me this? And so you push away the people in your life that love you and care about you the most, which is only going to feed the cycle of depression and loneliness. Um, and yeah, it's objectively a, 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 a bad game plan. Uh, for, for learning how to overcome these things. I, like this to me, man, like this conversation, I think this is our generation smoking. The, the problem is that the problem is that smoking was an easy problem to solve uh, or a simple problem to solve. I should say easy, maybe not so much because it's an addictive thing. And, and, you know, for a long time, it was such a huge part of culture. Like there was a lot of people who struggled with quitting and still do to this day. Um, so not to, again, uh, uh, not to minimize the difficulty of those things. Uh, but it was, it was a simple solution. It was like, as soon as they had the data, they were like, Hey, stop smoking. And that's going to solve the problem. But loneliness is not easily solved. It's, it's not the same way. It's not just like, Hey, stop being lonely. It's, it's a, it's an internal subjective feeling of, of being isolated. And that's a more difficult problem to solve. And if we don't start having these conversations now, I think that we're going to see a lot of these negative repercussions that are happening in the, in, in the distant future, not even the next 10 years, like the next 50 years, 100 years, you know, we're, we're solving Western medicine is a miracle, man, we're solving a lot of problems health wise. And there, you know, people are saying now that, that there's people that are alive today, that'll be, that'll live to be 150. And, and you know, and older. Um, but that's only a calculation of Western medicine. <laughs> it's only a projection of, of, you know, the, the leaps and bounds that we've made in those other fields. 
it has nothing to do with this, like this loneliness thing, um, which I think is, I think it's, I think it's going to decrease lifespan more than we're willing to admit because it's the root cause of um, so many of these things that they're even related to physical health. Uh, it, loneliness and, and these social isolation, these things can cause legitimate physical problems like a, a increased inflammation in your body. Uh, there's plenty of data to support that it's, uh, that it um, uh, is bad for mental health, for uh, uh, dementia, uh, increases risk of uh, Alzheimer's, increases risk of cancer. It's more detrimental for your physical health than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. I've seen that. That's yeah. crazy. It's more than drinking three alcoholic beverages a day is, is loneliness. And so we don't think that it's that big of a problem because like I said, it's not as it, because it doesn't have an obvious solution. It's easy for us to put it on the back burner. Um, and it's because it's not as objectively measurable. It's easy for us to put on the back burner, but I don't, I think that if we don't solve it, like I said, 30, 50, 70 years from now, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to experience really, really negative long-term side effects of this. It's, it, it's increased risk in all cause mortality. Um, it, loneliness is so, yeah, man, if we, if, you know, if, if we, if we don't get ahead of the problem, it's going to become a even bigger problem. Yeah. I've, I've been in a few podcasts and they usually finish off with a question in terms of if I had one piece of advice to give to men out there, what, what would it be? And it, it's usually what I usually respond to is, uh, respond with is that every man out there needs to create peace and solitude in his life on a regular basis and just be completely alone because uh, that's when he can really truly understand and connect with himself and yeah that to me is you know breaking the this epidemic of, of loneliness we have right now is yeah. there anything more that you could perhaps add to that or do you have a different perception in terms of how we can stop this rut right now yeah man um so I'm, I'm looking for something that i wrote down one time Let's see. Uh, yeah, here it is. Loneliness and aloneness. Uh, loneliness and aloneness are very different things. And ironically, the antidote to loneliness is aloneness. To be at peace alone with yourself is to experience the foundation of happiness and abundant relationship with others. Aloneness is not having the company of other people. You're right in the middle of people. You're enjoying them immensely, but they no longer have the power to make you happy or miserable. In the solitude, your dependence uh, uh, your dependence leaves and your capacity to love is born for no, for one no longer sees others as means of satisfying their addiction. Um, so I think you hit the nail on the head, man. That that's a lot of the stuff that I've written down. And some of this is kind of a summary of, there's a great book called awareness by Anthony DeMello. Um, and he has a whole section on this stuff. And this was kind of my thoughts after listening to that section. Um, and I, I, I just completely agree you, that that's, that's the whole problem is that you think that the cure to your loneliness is to go be around other people. And then all you're doing is putting the burden of curing your loneliness on the people that you love the most, which is, and, and again, and I know we talked about earlier, like you should be willing to share your problems with people, but that's not sharing your problems with people. That's expecting other people to solve your problems. That, and that's a different thing. Um, share your struggle with the caveat that you are the one that ultimately has the power to overcome it. And sure, people can help you, but if you can be at peace and in solitude by yourself with people or without people, uh, then you will experience more um, happiness, more fulfillment, more joy when you're by yourself, and you'll experience a much greater form of happiness when, you, uh, when you're with other people. Because other people, I, you know, relationships with other people are, are clearly the path to happiness. They're the largest, the longest uh, study ever done on, on happiness in humans was done by Harvard. It was completed... I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and it and it followed people throughout their entire lives. And they were trying to measure happiness. And they had all these external uh, markers that they were measuring that they thought would that their hypothesis was would lead to happiness, external success, money, um, status, uh, physical health, all these types of things, low cholesterol, whatever. Um, and what they found was, by far, the people that were happiest at the 